or aware of the whole breath you are doing the right thing. You don't need to use any word. No label. Not necessary. So, when you really stop thinking and just become in touch with it, immediately the mind switches into another kind of mode, another, a different mode. So you are familiar with the, mo- the word mode. Uh, in your cassette or in your television, you have mode, many different modes. So the mind also has different modes of working. Whenever we use a word, we are functioning in this ordinary reality. When we stop using the word, any kind of word, or any kind of shape or image, our mind works in a different mode. So that's what we need to do in meditation. We are working in a different mode, trying to understand things in a different way, not in the normal way that we used to do. So as soon as you use the word, you are bringing your mind back to ordinary way of working and seeing. So this will happen in the beginning. We, we cannot really uh, eradicate that immediately. But whenever it happens, become aware of that also, thinking, words, labeling, naming. It is useful for a beginner, but after a while, we have to let go of it. Just like walk, using, using a walking stick when you walk. When you see weak, you need something to support you. A walking stick or even a rope. You tie a long rope for some people who are disabled for some injury when they do something to rehabilitate, to learn to walk again, they need to hold on to something so that they will not fall down, they will not go off the way. So you hold on the rope and then you walk slowly. But after you have learned to walk and you don't need the rope anymore, let go. Because if you keep doing that, what happens? What happens if you keep holding on to the rope? Yes, you become dependent on that and then it becomes a hindrance. So, let's say you're walking and you're using your walking stick. So, each step you take, you put down your walking stick. And then you take another step, you put down your walking stick. And if you are very weak and you walk very slow, it is very useful and helpful. But when you have learned to run, and you try to do that, take one step and put down the stick, and take another step and put down the stick, and you do that. If you try to do that, you have to play. So you just put the walking stick away. It was useful, but now it is not useful. So you need to be very skillful in the way you practice. So for a beginner, it is useful breathing in, breathing out, breathing in, breathing out. Very useful. Because your mind is so scattered, agitated. So just to keep your mind on one breath is difficult. So you use the word to keep, bring your mind back again and again on breathing. But after you've learned to stay with the breath, let go of this long breathing in. Just use in. After a while, let go of that even. No need to say anything anymore. So for a beginner, there are many, many ways of developing some concentration and awareness. Just like I told you before, even in one breath, you say one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, up to ten. Try to do that. As you breathe in, you count in your mind. Uh, the minimum five or the maximum ten. Why do you do that? You want to keep your mind on that again and again. You are putting your mind on breathing again and again. Because if you don't do that, one second you are aware of it, another second you are away. You are thinking of something else. So in order not to go out, not to think of something else, you try to count. Breath. One, two, three, four, five. Maybe six, maybe seven, eight, nine, ten. So it is useful for a beginner. After a while, you don't need to count, you don't need to name, you don't need to do anything anymore. Just do it. And as you are meditating like that, you feel sensation in your body. Sometimes you feel hot, sometimes you feel cold. Sometimes there's a tingling sensation, sometimes sharp pain, sometimes dull pain. When the sensation becomes very, very strong, naturally your mind goes to the pain. You can't stop it from going there. So when it goes there, deal with it, no problem. Because Vipassana 
can sneeze object. As long as you are with the object, as long as you don't think, the difference. That's why Vipassana concentration is called Kanika Samadhi. Kanika Samadhi, we translate that as momentary concentration. So, momentary concentration means the object changes, but the, the concentration is still there. One object lasts for a few moments, and you are with that object. And it disappears, and your mind is on another object which lasts for a few moments, for a moment actually, and you are with that. So momentary concentration doesn't mean that you are aware of it only, uh, your concentration is only for a moment. It means that your concentration is moment, 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 moment. It goes on like that. So for example, let's say, if I hit like this, every time I hit, you hear it. One moment, another hitting, another hearing, another hitting, another hearing. Moment, 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 moment. It goes on like that. Without any break in between, without any break means without getting distracted. So that is Kanika Samadhi. So when any kind of very strong and obvious sensation happens, whether it's the sound, whether it's the pain, be with it, no problem. So when you meditate, Whatever happening right now is the object of our meditation. Not what happened before, not what will happen. So this here is a very good example. In a rainy day, cloudy, and there is thunder, grumbling thunder all the time, you go out and look at the sky, once in a while you see a flash. And it lasts for a few seconds and disappears. So, you cannot tell what shape it will be. When it happens, you are aware of it. When it's not there, it's not there anymore. You, ha- you don't have to think about it anymore. So, be ready, be present. An object will come and you are aware of it. One or another. These are experiences of not to go back to the past, not to go ahead and think of the future, not to expect anything. Not expect, not to expect what will happen next. Not to try to create experience. Not to make your meditation experience better. But to be with whatever is happening complete. That is the, the most important aspect of meditation. To be with whatever is. And here, when walking, so in a retreat or in a home, and I do that in the hallway also in inside the place. I walk. Because we cannot sit all the time. Our body needs to move, needs some exercise. Change of posture is very important. Because Buddha said, when you keep your body in one position for too long, I don't know how long is too long, it depends on different people, different length of time. So if you keep your body for too long, it becomes painful. When the pain becomes very painful, unbearable, the mind gets agitated. When the mind gets agitated, there's no calmness or peace. There's no samadhi anymore. And with no samadhi, no insight. No insight, no liberation. This means that when you become, when the pain becomes unbearable, you don't have to be with that pain. You can change the pain. But when you change your posture, you must be very mindful. When sitting, you want to move a little bit. You can do that. But slowly move. And then as you move, you can see the pain getting less and less. Feel that pain getting less and less. Don't change your posture immediately uh, without being aware of the slowly changing, uh, lessening of the pain. Because if you do that, there's a gap you are not aware of. You are not mindful of. So when there's pain in your limbs, your mind doesn't like it. You want to get rid of it. This is the habit, and actually this is useful to you. Because if you don't do something about it, uh, you might hurt yourself. For example, let's say, when you pick up something very hot, you immediately let go of that. Because if you don't do that, it will burn you. This is a kind of survival uh, reaction that we have learned. 
But considering and meditating, we know that there's no real danger. There's pain. So as long as you can live, you can be with the pain, try to endure the pain. And see how your mind reacts. This is a very important learning process. So Buddha said, Atura Kayasa Mesato, Chittam Anaduram Bhoisati. Very deep and profound teaching. Although my body is in pain, my mind will not be in pain. This is something we should practice. Because we cannot really get rid of all the pain in our body. As you grow older and older, you know that you have to learn to live with pain. Some people have arthritis. There's no way you can run. I know. If you take too much medicine, it will destroy your liver, your kidney, your digestion system, and many other things it can do. But if you have to take the medicine, it's okay. I'm not, I won't tell you not to take medicine. But for normal pain, it is not going to hurt you very much. So try to be with the pain and see how the mind reacts. In some cases, we try to move. Not because the pain is unbearable. Because we move because we are restless. We move because we are in the habit of not uh, being in touch with the pain, uh, not learning to be with the pain. So, when you feel pain, without thinking of pain, without even using the word pain, so in the beginning you can say pain, pain, pain. But I've noticed that if you use the word pain, it becomes more painful. Because you are interpreting it as pain as something you don't like. Your mind automatically reacts to the word pain. So if you stop using the word pain and just get into the pain, be with the pain, you'll find that it's very interesting. Your mind can stay there for a long time. So some of my friends who are very scared of pain, they don't want to meditate because they think that it will be very painful. But slowly and slowly they learn to meditate and after a while, they come in touch with the pain, they can stay with the pain. And they found out that it's very interesting. They become very calm, they get absorbed in the pain. So, if you are willing to be with the pain, it is not so unbearable. If you are unwilling, then it becomes more and more unbearable. So, it's the way your mind uh, look at the experience, uh, which makes the experience uh, get Worse or get less. So whenever you see pain, be with it. It won't kill you. And when you find that this is my limit, really honestly, I can't go on doing like this, sitting like this anymore. Oh, slowly. So very slowly, just move a few millimeters and see the pain getting less. The whole thing, the whole experience, and the mind also, when the pain gets a little bit less, your mind becomes a little bit relaxed. Oh, it's nice now. Feeling better now. And then move a little bit again. Feeling more better now. And move again. Uh, it's now very, very good now. And then you find another posture, another position where you can, you don't see pain anymore. You feel happy. You feel very relaxed. And then sit in meditate again. Back to breathing. <coughs> And then after sitting for an hour, or sometimes people sit for two hours even, in Burma, some people sit for five hours, six hours, and some people sit even more than that. You might not believe it, but really some people sit for 24 hours. Really, they really sit 24 hours, not eating, not drinking. You can do that. So when I see people, they can't even sit for one hour. If they want to, they can train their body. They can. But they think that nobody can do more than this. So when you think that this is your limit, when you come to that point, your body will react too much. When you know that I can do more than this, then your body doesn't react. Your mind doesn't react. You can learn to test with your limit slowly and slowly, slowly and slowly. And after you can sit for three hours, then you find that meditation gets very deep, deep, deep. It becomes more and more clear. Stop thinking, you get deeper and deeper and deeper in touch with the reality, and you can see very fine, subtle things happening. 
So that's why it is important to learn to sit longer. And also standing meditation, uh, people do standing meditation too. I don't see people standing here. I see people sitting on the floor or sitting in the chair. Try to meditate standing sometimes. It's just quiet for a while. But if you cannot maintain your body, and if you are afraid that you will fall down, if you have something, put your hands on, a kind of rail or something, or a table, you can do that. Stand, put your hands on the table. That will give you the balance. Give you the balance. You stand and meditate. Sometimes it's very good to do that. So stand as long as you can, and then you walk. So when you walk also, do it very mindfully. Begin from the, from the intention to walk. So you stand for a long time, and then your body really wants to change the posture. You really want to move. And that real intention is very strong. It comes boom, like that. You can't stand anymore. You don't want to stand anymore. And you feel that energy. You want to move. Sometimes you feel like your body is moving. Although your feet are still there, you feel like your body is pulling. Something is pulling. You can feel that energy in the mind and in the body. The moment you, your mind thinks of moving, immediately something happens in your body. In that part of the body which you decide or you decide to move, that part of the body becomes very different. All the nerves and all the muscles become immediately ready to move. And you feel the energy there. Uh, the blood and the, the nerve and the muscle becoming tense. And then when you become aware of that, you let go of that. Naturally, you let go of that. And you are standing there again. And then after a few seconds, that urge or that very strong desire to move comes back again. You know that desire coming. Sometimes you see something here. Tight. Something rushing up. You feel that again. And then after a few times, you really decide to move. And then you move. Move very slowly and see the feeling, the sensation, the tension. You feel something happening in your muscle. So get into the feeling, not the shape. So you say walking, 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 walking. For a beginner, it's okay. But here you are not beginners. This is a class for advanced meditators. So, but I want to go back to the beginner stage also. For a beginner, you say left, right, left, right, left, right. What do you say left, right? Just words. You call this right and you call this left. Just a name. And you, you are also aware of the shape. It's long legs. It's brown and long. Moving forward, stretching, and moving again. So for a beginner it's okay. But after a while, it's not a shape. It's not a name. It's the sensation. Why you move? It's the sensation that should be the object of meditation. How do you feel in your muscle? And also the mind. How do you feel in the mind? So, when you try to do it very mindfully, you find that even to move your, your, your foot a little bit, you need the whole body to cooperate. Without the cooperation of the whole body and mind, you cannot move even an inch. Because, let's say, you are standing there, and you decide to move, what happens? You shift the body weight onto another leg. That leg has to cooperate to take the whole body weight. And to free, for example, let's say you are moving the right leg, to free the right leg, the left leg cooperates and takes the whole body weight and make it very tight so that you won't fall down. And then your left, your right leg is free now, it moves a little bit, and see how what happens. If you really move, even a, a few millimeters, you can feel it right up to your head. From your toe to your head, things change. The whole body on the left, left leg also, from the toe to the head, everything changes. You can feel the whole thing happen. Energy, too much energy. Not simple to move. It's a very complex uh, process going on. So, get interested. You are not in a hurry to do anything. What you are doing is to see what is happening in your body when you take one step. 
Just do it with deep interest. What is happening now? If you do that, you can get very interested and because of that interest, your mind becomes calm down and get absorbed. And without, because of that absorption also, and with, because of this samadhi, you see more energy and sometimes some kind of joy to This joy is very close to interest. If you have no interest, you have no joy. So one translation, one meaning of PT is interest. PT means interest, PT means yes, or PT means joy, all together. So it gets very, very interesting. What happens if I try to move? You are not moving, but you are just trying to move it. What happens to your whole body and mind? So if you do that, you walk from this place to that end of the hall. If you do that very slowly, you can get very absorbed. The samadhi can become very strong. So some people say that walking meditation is not good because you don't develop samadhi. Maybe that person hasn't really tried to walk with deep interest. If you do that with deep interest, you develop very strong samadhi. And Buddha said that the samadhi that you develop from practicing walking meditation is much stronger than the samadhi you develop while you are sitting. Very important to know because in the moving process, if you can stay with that, your awareness is stronger. So you will you will change posture, you will hear, you will see, you will see many things. Try to be in touch with the whole process as much as possible without thinking about it. So in that process you will find that there is the intention, the decision, the desire, the wanting arising in your mind. There is a wanting to move, wanting to see, wanting to listen. Or wanting to drink, sometimes you are sitting meditating, you think, oh, you want to drink. And that desire is very strong. You feel the desire. Sometimes you see even the cup of water, a glass of water. So oh, nice it would be to drink a glass of water. Sometimes you are sitting and you have something itching going on some, somewhere in your body. Itching, itching. You want to scratch. So before you go to scratch, you can see the desire, the wanting to scratch. And then, before you move your hand, once you decide to move your hand, your hand, you feel very different. Something going on here. Yeah. The energy in the hand has changed immediately. Feel that energy. Something happens there. Something is happening there. And then, in your image also, in your mind image, you see your hand going like this. But your real hand is still there. But in your mind, you see the image of your hand going in to scratch. So you become aware of that. And actually, you move slowly, scratch, and slowly put back the hand, and go on with it. So it's actually very simple. What I'm telling you now is actually very, very simple. But it's hard to be simple. We make things more and more complicated. So to meditate is actually very, very simple. So can you do that? Are you willing to be simple? So now I think I'll give you a chance to ask questions. Next week, uh, yes, uh, this week also when I talk about this consciousness and object, it is actually Nama Rupa Parishuddha Jnana, the first insight. No being, no name, no shape, just sensation and awareness. You know that there's a sensation, there's an awareness. And sensation is nature, natural phenomenon, and awareness also is natural phenomenon. This consciousness is not a being. You are not creating it, it is happening because of the condition. And when you see this, the two things very clearly, that is the first insight. So I'll try to talk about four insights again and again to get the four very, very clear. I don't want to leave anything out. But after the four, the rest is quite simple. There are ten insights, but the first four are the most important. So, awareness of object and consciousness, very clearly, seeing both as natural phenomena, not a being, not a man, not a woman, that is the first insight. 
uh, talking about walking. Sankama Buddha taught about walking meditation. In that part, Buddha said that walking meditation gives you samadhi and it's very strong. Because, because you are moving all the time, you need to have more energy. You need to put more energy to be in touch with the process. When something is stable, it's easier to be with that and you can just relax. But when something is changing and moving, you have to put more effort, more energy into it. And once you develop that sort of energy, effort, and develop that mindfulness, and you go and sit, it's quite simple, easy. Try to do that yourself and you'll find why. Walk in a place like this, if you have a place uh, where you can walk 10 steps, that's quite enough for you to do walking meditation. Because each step will take quite a long time. Do it with your deep interest. After you walk from this place to that place, very mindfully, and have a place to sit on that side, and go there and sit down very mindfully, and see what happens. You get more calm and more peaceful and more mindful. So I suggest that do walking meditation first and then do sitting meditation. You really feel the difference. So for beginners, it's very important to do both. But as you develop deeper and deeper samadhi, after a while you can sit for two hours and sit for one, or walk for one hour. And then after a while you sit for three hours and walk for one hour. Just to give your body some exercise. You can get deeper and deeper into your samadhi. So try to do that at home. Uh, in the section of the Vipatana, there's one section talking about walking meditation. And if you can find the commentary of that section, you'll get, you'll get uh, more detailed instructions. And Buddha talk about benefits of walking also. That you will find in, in Gutra. Gutra means uh, gradual things. In the group of five. More questions? The sensitivity of the body. Body, the skin actually. Also deep in the muscle you feel something. Whatever you feel on your body. You feel it because of the sensitivity of the body. Sensitivity of the eye, sensitivity of the ear, sensitivity of the nose. The nose is sensitive to smell. The tongue is sensitive to taste. The eye is sensitive to light and color. The ear is sensitive to sound vibration. The body is sensitive to uh, hot or cold, uh, hard, soft, movement, vibration, tension. The sensitivity of the body. Sensory receptor. Uh, that's the medical word for it. Sensory receptor. Sensory receptor. It's nice if you can learn these words that makes you very clear and understand. So before you really meditate, get very clear about what it is. But while you are meditating, you don't think about it anymore. Yes? Yes, yes. Vedana Nupasana means you are aware of the pain. Not only pain, Vedana, Sukha Vedana, Dukha Vedana, and Upatha Vedana. What I'm telling you is, you are with the pain, but you are not uh, naming it anymore. In the beginning you name it, but after a while you don't name it anymore, you are with the pain. Whether it's Tukha or Dukha or Upaka, you are with the pain. So being or with the pain is Vedana Nupasana. You are doing it without naming it. Oh, that's, oh I see, I see. Oh. Mm-hmm. Uh, three kinds of wisdom. In the body, we see all three. 
Sukha and Dukha and also Upika also. But most of the time there is some sort of uh, slight pain in the body all the time, but we don't pay attention. So when we pay attention, then we feel it. So when there's no pain anymore, you feel very light. Sometimes in meditation, you feel so peaceful and calm and so light. All the pain is gone. There's Sukha with him. And sometimes there's Upaka with him. Neither pleasant nor unpleasant. But in the eye, for the sensitivity of the eye, uh, Chakru Patada, actually for that Chakru Patada, the Vedana is only Upaka. For Sotra also, only Upaka. For the smell also, the smell comes and goes into your nose, you don't really feel pain. You feel only the, uh, the smell, you are aware of the smell only. So there's no sukha or dukkha. But when you smell something terrible, your body and mind react to that. That's another process. One of my friends, he had an accident, and after that, he couldn't smell anything anymore. He had no smell anymore. So he might be walking in a place with asthma, he doesn't react. So where the night and sing leaves me? Pain. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. So in Pali it has three, three types. And in the mind also, Samanasa, Dhamanasa, and Upatsadi. Three. Mm-hmm. But I noticed that there are a lot of Pali words in Sinhalese language. Uh, kaya Pasada. Mm-hmm. Yes, Pasada also, in Pali also. It, it has different meaning. One meaning is nice, pleasant. Any more questions? Mm-hmm. You see, more weight on another leg. Or this like heaviness, you mean? When you lift a... Uh, because it has weight, you know, you have to overcome the gravity just o- to overcome the resistance. You have to put some effort to lift it. You need effort. That's the kind of resistance. Mm-hmm. Well, you know, we are so used to moving that we don't really know how much effort it takes. So, for, to tell you one example, uh, once, a long time ago, uh, our friends agreed to arrange a situation where one can meditate without doing anything at all. One man can meditate without doing anything. It means you just put out the bowl in front of the door, close the door and sit in the meditation. Somebody will take away the, the bowl, a monk will take away the bowl, put the food and fill up all the water pots and clean the whole thing and bring back and put the bowl there. And when we feel ready to eat, we just open the door and take the bowl and eat it. Nobody will come and disturb you. So we do that for a long, long time, just sitting and meditating many, many hours and just going out to get some exercise walking for a few minutes only to stretch the legs and come back and sit in the The eyes just drop in, no effort. The whole body becomes so relaxed that after a while it's very difficult even to open the eyes. Even the eyelids to open so much effort. You need so much energy to open the eyes. And when you start talking again, because we do that for many days, sometimes months. So after a while you start to talk, so much energy you need to really develop, to talk. And your muscles also, the cheek muscles also become so soft that even to smile, so difficult to smile. So we don't really know this uh, bara. You know what bara means? The burden. <laughs> we are so used to it. Yes. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Not really, actually. 
material. In the beginning, if you do that for a few months, and you start thinking, you find that it's difficult to think. But it's only for a while. Because we do that again and again, off and on. When I live in, the, in my place in Jemana, I live there alone for at least four months. But when you come out of that, in the beginning it's, it's a bit difficult. Because you don't want to think, because it's not necessary to think. But when you have to say something, you know exactly what to say without going around. You say it's short and to the point. Very clear. Before, yes? Mm-hmm. When you want to say something, you get impressed with what you want to say and say it very clearly. And also, before we meditate, we take these names and ideas and the association of these names and ideas very, very serious. But after you meditate, you know that these are, these are just interpretations. You don't take these things very seriously, but you know the meaning. You interpret in the same way, the right way, and you use it appropriately without taking things too serious. So you use it without being imprisoned by the concepts and ideas and names. Concepts and ideas and names are prisons. They are useful though, but they are also prisons. So if we really want to free our mind, we have to learn, we have to know what they are, the limitations, how they affect us, and also go beyond words and concepts and ideas. So this is one form of reality. It's important for our survival. If we don't interpret things in the right way, we will not survive. So this is necessary for our survival. In the evolution process, we have learned to interpret things the right way. Especially in the forest, we are sitting there, we hear something. If you don't interpret it the right way, you'll be eaten up by a tiger. (laughs) So when you hear a tiger, you just shut the door. If you keep it open, maybe you'll be in trouble. So, to interpret things in the right way is also useful, but when you want to go beyond the ordinary reality, you need to leave all those behind. They are necessary, they are useful, but for a certain amount of time, you leave these things behind and go beyond the ordinary reality. Yes, that is true. If you can do that, it's very helpful for you to develop deep insight. But for beginners, I won't suggest doing that. Because uh, it is better to develop gradually. So if you let a person, you meet, suddenly you take somebody and tell him, tell him, go and live in that place, in that small room, don't come out, we bring food. You just take the food and eat, and just stay there for a month. That person will go crazy. You know, we are always trying to run away from ourselves. We can't face what's inside. There are so many things inside. All sorts of memories, and emotions, and feelings, and desires. So much inside. So, if you suddenly do that, everything will explode. Gradually learn to do. It's not easy to be with yourself all the time. Yes, yes. We learn to do it slowly and slowly, gradually, gradually. That is true. If you have learned to live with yourself and just watch and let go, just watch and let go without reacting, you can develop very deep samadhi and very deep insight. Mm-hmm. Yeah. It comes naturally, actually. You don't deliberately do anything. It happens, yes. If you can do just one thing, honestly be aware of whatever is happening, without misinterpreting anything, the rest will happen. That's the beauty of the practice, actually. You know that if, I be, if I'm mindful, honestly, 
Rescue at the moment. Whatever difficulty comes in your mind, if you can be aware of that difficulty, a question comes in your mind. Oh, I don't know what to do. Just be aware of that question. Don't know what to do. If you can do that, you will, your mind becomes calm again. And after a while, you know what to do. So you find out what to do without thinking of it. Many people do the same thing. So we, we talk this with our teacher. People come and ask him questions and questions and questions. He is very patient, very kind. And he answer every question. But after a while, many many times he said, be more mindful, you find your own answer. That is really very important because he is now passed away who is going to answer the question. No, my teacher. I uh, not my master. My teacher in Burma. Uh, his real name is a venerable Dhamma Nandia. Yes, when you become very, very mindful, your mind sometimes cannot think. Especially when you develop uh, some sort of samadhi and insight, even though you try to divert your mind to another object, it won't go there, it comes back. Just leave it. Just stay there for a while, and then after a while you'll be ready to do other things. When it is not ready to do that, don't force it. It's something like a kind of a hypnotic state also. When you are in a hypnotic state, you don't, you don't come up quickly. Take your time and slowly come up. A kind of absorption. We pass now also can get very absorbed. So when you are in that state, don't force yourself to come out quickly. Take your time. But after a few minutes, you feel ready to think about something else. Thinking is a burden. It's to be here. So take your time, and just a few minutes is enough to prepare your mind that you are going to come out of it. If you are very calm and peaceful, if there is no thought, no agitation, it's a great experience. So nice to go away from all the words. These words are so tiring. 